we're live. LensSec Live, what's your perspective? And I'm excited to welcome the program, first of all, my co-host, but everyone needs to go to LensSec.com Live to catch up to all the episodes. I'm excited to welcome my co-host, Keith Harris. Keith, how are you, man? Hey, Neil, I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day. It's a gorgeous day. And uh, this again, Pittsburgh, freezing cold snow, but always enjoying it. I'm excited about our guests. So I'm excited to welcome the program and really a great guy, Tom Larson with MBX Systems out of Chicago. He's a value add contract manufacturer. Tom, thanks for stopping by. What's your perspective? How are you? I'm doing great. Great. Thanks guys for having me. Oh, it's always great. And I'm going to learn so much from you. Tom, you're the director of sales and security for MBX. Tell us a little about MBX and the types of products and services. Yeah, so MBX is a 26-year-old business out of the Chicago, although we have facilities over in Europe as well. Um, the core business uh, is building appliances, server storage appliances for software vendors. Um, the business itself is broken into many verticals or many different divisions. Uh, some of the divisions are streaming video. So think of the streaming video services that you're streaming into your house is, is the, uh, some of the customer base there. We have a cybersecurity vision where we're building hardware appliances for the cybersecurity software companies. Um, we also have a military division where we're, we're specialized uh, military products, uh, server storage that goes into military vehicles. Um, we go into live events. So think of uh, Super Bowls. Um, we were, we're building specialized server and storage GPU uh, servers to uh, support those softwares in that vertical. And then the safety security is, is um, it's a little bit newer. I've been doing the uh, servers and storage in the safety security space for about 15 years with a different company. And when, um, when I came over into MBX and we launched formally into it, uh, the big thing that we're doing is, is working with a lot of the safety and security software vendors to create a hardware program um, with very purpose-built product to you know, service the, the, the industry. How does that look for you in terms of uh, um, you know, making sure that some of the, uh, the hardware is up to speed and up to capabilities? Um, video is a hard, hard uh, master to live with in terms of uh, <laughs> need for uh, appliances. What are you guys doing to help make sure that that stuff is up to snuff? So, you know, this is a little bit, you know, goes outside of the MBX realm. It's just, you know, my background as, a, as an engineer and that is, is we, you know, back when I started to do a lot of testing on, on server and storage hardware, um, the, the workloads were very different than the IT workloads. Um, if you asked an IT professional, hey, uh, can you build me a server to support video? Generally, the IT professionals will, will put their money in big processors and a lot of RAM. And that's that's great. You did it. You built a you know, nice expensive machine, but it actually won't yield any more video out of that machine because the RAM and the processors is not the bottleneck. So, you know, back years ago when I was studying this and looking at it is you had to understand how the video flew, flows through the servers and where those bottleneck occur and then how you overcome those bottlenecks to get high throughput. Um, you know, kind of a little bit. If you think about the game, the, the game of video surveillance is, is very simple. We need to, from a hardware perspective, we need to ingest the video. So the video is going to come in from the cameras. It's going to get processed through a software, LensSec, right? And then we need to get it to disk as fast as possible. That's the game, okay? And we, we need to build purpose-built products for that. So what we end up doing is, is we, we have a pretty good idea exactly what, these hard, what the hardware is going to yield with, let's say, your software running on it. And what we'll do is we'll actually... Uh, as we onboard a customer, we'll actually build a, build a portfolio that is um, locked in. So we know, and the reason why we want to lock into a purpose-built box is that we, so we know the actual performance, because that's what your customers, whether it's a security integrator or the end user, they're saying, what will this box yield to me from a performance standpoint? Um, some of the things that we get tripped up on is, and this kind of goes back to the analog days, is everybody talks about camera counts, and unfortunately, we need to throw that in the trash. The camera count. We need to get rid of that terminology because it's not about camera counts anymore when, when you're getting into IP video. It's about bandwidth. Stream sizes and bandwidth is what's key. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, everybody likes to talk about, oh, it's a 32 channel box. That mm. really doesn't tell us anything about the, the, um, the performance of these boxes. So when you bring, when you, when we work with, with customers, we're, we're going to be bringing them on, we're going to be running their software, we're going to be looking at testing it. 
Maybe they have testing procedures they have, or maybe we have to do it for them. And we're going to come to a, a performance out of those boxes. The things that you, I guess, is a, a big concern there is uh, the changing nature of cameras and the streams that they use. Uh, you know, for mm-hmm. example, your uh, your standard, um, you know, ten year old analog camera is obviously not going to need, need near as much bandwidth and capability as a multi megapixel camera. Um, Correct. Some of those cameras are are I mean, it's really crazy what they're producing now. You're getting uh, um, into double digits in terms of megapixels that can be delivered from a camera, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that everybody should be using those multi megapixel cameras in terms of like a 24 or 30 megapixel camera, right? Right, but you know we are seeing that you know the PTZ camera is starting to see some. You know, if nobody's manning the system, what good's the PTZ camera? So now we're starting to see these four head multi megapixel. And it's, you know, by the time you add up the four heads, it's 33 megapixel. <laughs> and, you know, you got some big bandwidth coming off those. And we're seeing more and more of that happening where, you know, out in front of the business is no longer that, um, you know, sorry, Pelco, Pelco PTZ, you know, that, that has been there for 30 years. What, what we got there is we have, you know, some sort of a, you know, multi camera imager out there uh, with some pretty hefty bandwidth, but it's given value to, to, to the customer there because they can see everything that's happening in front of their business now, and not just where the camera's there's pointed. Also, there's a lot of, also a lot of overhead when it comes mm-hmm. with so many megapixels coming down. Mm-hmm. The pipe. You, have, right. you have to worry about, you know, like you said, the bandwidth and the, the throughput that you're able to get from the camera all the mm-hmm. way through the software and the server to yeah. a store, place to store it. Yeah. And what's what's happening though recently is is the servers are getting very robust though, okay, very powerful. Intel with very large processors. We're seeing the you know we're seeing AMD. Watch out, security industry. You will see AMD bigger and bigger over the next two years. Oh wow! Uh, in this space, so that we we have plenty of compute, RAM, plenty of RAM we could put in these machines. We are not a RAM hungry industry. Okay, we actually use kind of not a lot of RAM. But what we're seeing is very robust RAID controllers and the hard drives. Um, and the game here is very robust RAID controllers and the amount of hard drives we can um, um, support off of a single machine. More hard drives or spindles, more bandwidth. So what we're seeing is, is we're very easily getting into the gig range of streaming video into a single box. You know, um, So we're getting, you know, I think... You know, we, we've done testing and I wouldn't recommend of running this in, in, a, in a, a real live environment, but we're getting up around 2.5 gig wow. of video process in a single server. The, so, you know, there's other bottlenecks though, because right when you get into the six, seven, 800 mag range, you're going to start seeing the single gig network connection uh, being a bottleneck. So we're going to have to interface to 10 gig. But, you know, you think you do some fast math, you know, a two gig worth of processing in a single server you know, on, you know, a 10 meg stream, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's 200 cameras. That is a lot of video processing. And so I kind of have to start having these conversations with the customer saying, what is reasonable <laughs> yeah. to have on that server? You know, even though we have redundancy technologies out there and we're, we're, I know we're going to get to some of that, how many eggs you want in that basket? That's true. <laughs> you know, so I'm seeing that, you know, we're, we're getting back to the integrators and, and to everybody saying, you know, um, 150 cameras is kind of where I want to be on the max side, which is still a lot. I mean, you think about how, how big a facility is that would consume 150 cameras. It's a sizable place or a sizable campus. So that's the important thing to choose what storage to use and what not to use. And that's mm-hmm. a key part in the conversation with that end user and the integrator, Tom, is how much is too much to store on a server? And that well, I'm sure we'll get to that conversation soon. One of the latest trends we're hearing about is hyper-converged infrastructure or hyper-converged appliance. Can you break that down into what it means for the video surveillance industry? Yeah. So in, in the IT industry, we're already there. You know, we had the old classic three, two, one architecture. So what that means is, uh, you know, I'm going to go simplistic. Three servers running some sort of hypervisor, VMware, Hyper-V. Two switches, so there's your two, and a SAN storage or NAS storage. So it's three, two, one. That architecture was very popular, you know, from probably around 2004 
kind of all the way up to in some ways today. But what's the issue with that architecture is some major flaws in it. Okay. And the one is, is, is the actual, the number one in that three, two, one architecture, which is the SAN or NAS. Um, people think that they have an added redundancy because they have the virtualization, multiple servers, anything happens on the server level, it fails over to another server and they're protected up there. They get down to the second layer and the two switch architecture, they think they're they're protected there because they have two switches in a redundant manner. So the path, the data path is, it can always get to the same. And then they get down into the same and you're like, oh, it's dual controllers, multiple power supplies, disk pooling technology, and you think that you're fully protected there. The problem is, is if that SAN goes offline, if that SAN has to get updated, if anything happens to that SAN, your entire enterprise is down. So what has happened is, is that 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 has in the IT world said, that's not a good solution. Yeah. And so where we are shifting to is there's actually a movement of getting away from that SAN NAS altogether and to go into what's called hyperconverge. And what hyperconverge is, it's a clustering solution. Um, the, the brands out there for hyperconverge, you know, Dell with their VX Rail product, um, Pivot 3 with their um, virtualization for video surveillance. So they're very specialized on this. Um, scale computing, that's another virtualization software. Nutanix, right? These are kind of the players in that virtual in the hyperconverged market. And essentially what we're doing is you're taking high density to you commodity servers from a Dell and HP of the world. And you're starting off generally with three of them with two switches in the back plane. So the two switches are going to create your cluster. And what happens is, is that all the data is essentially saved in two places within that cluster. And how you scale them out is you just keep adding nodes or servers to it. And it just keeps scaling out your compute and your storage right on out. Um, you know, today, some of the more dense to you servers can get up into the 400 terabyte range per, per server. Wow. So you think if you start off with three of them, you're up at about a petabyte of raw storage before um, 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 RAID protection. Now, what we're also seeing in that hyperconverge is they're not using traditional RAID technology. They're using something called erasure coding, which is going to get you more efficiencies in the storage and will give you higher... Just think about it like RAID six on steroids. Well, you know, for the people who who, who uh, maybe don't understand it, um, you know what erasure coding is, and any of the servers can fail in this cluster. Yeah. And the thing that's very cool about it for video surveillance is today, if you study what all, what the industry is doing, they're saying, hey, we have we we're high high availability or we're redundant, but they're really not. Because what, what's happening is, is everybody has a failover mechanism built into their VMSs, at least you know, the more enterprise, you know, a lot of the enterprise ones. And when the server is disrupted, something goes wrong with it, motherboard failure, RAID controller failure, something along that happens, it lightens up, lights up another failover server and moves these streams over to the new server, which they're recording. The downside of it, though, is that you as the operator of the system, you cannot get to any of that recorded video on the machine that just failed. And you actually have to wait until that machine gets repaired. And as you know, repairs always don't go perfect. And every once in a while, oops, somehow the data didn't get recovered, the machine didn't get fixed, and we're out that chunk of, could be 100 terabytes of data, which is, you know, could be substantial to, to an organization. So the hyperconverge is a lot um, is true always on would probably be a way of, of zero downtime solution. So if we did have a server go down and hyperconverge, you have full availability to not only your live video, but also all of your recorded video. And you're so talking, you're talking here about, um, you know, obviously this would be key for markets, certain market industries that, uh, that need zero mm -hmm. downtime. Um, you're not talking about your, your average uh, mom and no. pop shop. You're talking about no. government facilities. Uh, you mentioned uh, before the call, um, prisons or casinos. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, essentially, where where my feel is for hyperconverge, and it's and a lot of people want to say, oh, it's a thousand camera system. It's a you know, it's not. It could be a two camera system. Uh, now there may be better ways of doing it with two cameras, but um, if the end user is utilizing video as part of their job. 
And if the video was to go down or they couldn't get to recorded video, they couldn't do their job or they would face fines. There's, a, there's some other wow. topics in here too. Then hyperconverge is the only solution. I mean, we could talk on the extreme low end that you could dual stream a camera. Yes, that would work on, the, on, on a five and 10 camera job. And I would probably recommend doing something like that. But once you kind of get into, you know, probably north of 40, 50 cameras, um, hyperconverge is where you want to be. Awesome. Okay. So give us and, out an example for us of, of a particular industry that would use this and how. Well, how. Let's, I'll break down a couple. Um, casinos. You know, a lot of people may or may not know some of the casino uh, gaming rules is that basically if you lose video, so that, you know, you have video on all the tables and all the slot machines and that, if you lose video, they have to close the area off. So if you've ever out at the ISC West and you're walking through the Venetian and you notice that a, a whole area of it is roped off and nobody can gamble in that area, it may or may not be that they're cleaning the carpet. It might be that that area has video cameras that are down. And by Bay, uh, um, um, Nevada gaming laws, they have to shut that area down. Wow. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had some horror stories from some of the casino integrators tell me that, you know, I actually had one a couple of weeks ago where they took a massive power surge to the actual casino oh and they closed the entire casino. I mean, you could still get drinks, you could still get food, <laughs> but that was it. And they were down for the day, scrambling to get all this gear set back up. And, you know, there were some, there were some flaws in the overall design of the UPS system, which tore the whole place down, but that's, you know, it's a little bit, but you know, it speaks to the fact that if you don't have video, you can't be open. You know, you get into the, the cannabis market. Okay. A lot of regulations state by state, especially who's legalized. And, you know, at any time, one of the inspectors can come in from the state, ask for video. You don't have it. They're going to close down your dispensary for until they get to the bottom of it. And, you know, some of these dispensaries are bringing in 120 to $200,000 in cash per day. That's a lot of money. If you shut down for the day, they're going to go down the street to the other guy. <laughs> I'm name dropping. I talked to Tommy Chong about that. And Tommy talked about how dangerous it is. That's why we need the video surveillance because of the amount of crime that can happen. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that we see, Neil, cash a lot of times too. Tommy. Yeah, the other thing that we see is, see is a lot of these states have laws in place where the plant has to be in video surveillance for yeah. its entire cycle. All the way right. through the process, from from growing through production, through transportation, all the way to final product, and so um, that's a lot of cameras, and that's a lot of of uh, storage and uptime needed for that industry. Correct, and and you know, my, this is my perspective: is that we're going to see just about every state hop on the cannabis bandwagon for one reason only this year. I've is because every state needs the tax revenue to offset the losses of the pandemic. No, that's, that's it. So no. if you're a video surveillance integrator and you're thinking about where should I focus my, <laughs> my vertical, I highly suggest you figure out really cannabis talk. quick. You, I, I agree completely, Tom. Great point. Yeah, we've, we been are seeing great moves. Doing that too. we've been seeing great moves from some of our dealers in that market and um, yep. really uh, capturing the attention of of uh, what's going on there um, because it really is a moving industry. It's up and coming for yeah. video surveillance and everyone yeah. will be considering it right yeah. now. Very interesting so far as we're going into this. And again, a lot of interesting things we could cover with Tom and we probably have to have more than one show with Tom for sure. So I'm going to go into another trend we're hearing about is distributed edge. Same question. Where does that fit <laughs> in the security industry? So we're already doing edge edge computing, that, that is the security industry. Um, you know, so you kind of have two distinct, you have data center and you have edge, okay? So if it's not in the data center, it's edge, okay? So if you look at the video surveillance industry for the last 30 years, we've been, we're basically putting servers and storage and NVRs on the edge. Um, the edge kind of became more of a topic when IoT really became a thing. Um, video surveillance is part of the IOT internet of things. We happen to be the largest piece of the IOT industry today. Um, a lot of people still think that that's a different industry or that's, that's not video surveillance. And no, the reality is yes, we are IOT. 
Um, and so what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of technologies in IoT. Um, and I'm going to pick on the uh, oil and gas industry um, on the pipelines. There's a lot of data that is out there on the edge, on these pipelines that the um, operators need to get back. It could be uh, sensors of flow. It could be environmental things. And so what we've seen is an explosion in the IoT market of these little edge gateway boxes or, or boxes out there. And the struggle they have is it's the exact same struggle that we see in the video space is that they need to maintain and monitor these things. Okay. So video surveillance is edge. The, the struggle we have is that we don't really have a good mechanism today to manage that edge. Okay. Meaning knowing if the box is up or down, knowing what the health of the box is, um, knowing what's running on it. And so there's something evolving, okay, is going to be cloud managed. My prediction is that we will see more and more cloud managed devices uh, in IoT and also in the video surveillance industry where everybody will say, hey, I may not save my data in the cloud, but I want to manage my boxes or my servers, my video recording servers, access control servers from the cloud. So what happens is you will be able to, you know, through some of the technology that we're seeing in the IoT world, will merge or come into the impact this world, this video surveillance world, where you'll be able to log into the cloud through some two-factor authentication, you know, secure, and you'll be able to see all of your boxes across multiple end users, and you'll be able to see not only the health of the box, but you'll be also be able to see what software is on it, what's the rev of the software, um, and it's basically what we're adapting into is this whole um, VM on the edge, right. Kubernetes, Docker. You're going to see that our industry will start adapting those technologies. The struggle that we'll see is that we see a lot of technologies that are only Kubernetes or only Docker. And they're not, we're going to still need some sort of a VM that can be deployed by the cloud to that box because that, that VM will be able to handle the legacy applications. And so when you start cloud managing it, you'll be able to read back all the health of the box and then also be able to remotely try to fix those boxes without rolling a truck. And that's going to be huge for the security integrators is to drop that truck roll down. So this, this, this movement is happening today. I predict that we're going to start seeing some of this first stuff probably mid this year with people deploying uh, that way and being able to control the boxes from a management standpoint. And from that standpoint, that even increases the amount of bad bandwidth and uptime that you need in remote areas, in uh, um, little serviced areas. So, I mean, this points directly towards uh, um, more 5G capability uh, nationwide um, is, what, is what I read. Well, think about this. You have a fleet of 500 police cars. You have video on there. You got other applications that you want to run in the police car itself. Video might be one, but there might be four or five other applications you want to run in that police car. Mm -hmm. You drop in a temperature hardened fanless PC running, you know, this uh, the, the, this type of uh, of, a, of an architecture, and you can manage all of your cop cars. I mean, from from a health and perspective, right from the cloud and see everything that's going on. You're not going to be streaming back the video through that cloud. That's not what this is for. This is purely for manage, a remote orchestration and management of those vehicles. And if they have the 5G connection, you can push a new app right into the box without ever having to have all those cars come in, get service, get whatever, and push back out. We can do it all remote with, with a 5G type connection. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. That's kind of a relation that will be on what's your perspective next. We keep with our fleet management in a way of how we're utilizing that technology communication between an NVR and our uh, our servers back connected to the perspective of EMS. So interesting. Yeah. And we don't need 5G to do it though. We can do it on 4G right now. Exactly. And we're doing it as we yeah. are our fleet, our, with our fleet management already. All right. So let's kind of go to the next question. Again, I'm learning so much from Tom Larson, again, of MBX and it's just such unbelievable information. How involved are you and MBX with artificial intelligence? Deep learning, machine Oof. learning. What is the difference? All right. So we got deep learning. You know, I'm, I'm not going to get too deep into what's deep learning, what's machine learning. Let's let's that, that's the way that the actual AI operates. But right now, what we're seeing is we're seeing a huge influx of AI software companies coming into the space. Okay. 
Um, I probably deal with three to five new businesses a week looking for hardware to support their software. So we're seeing it. A lot of challenges there. They need to, you know, a lot of them are people that are not from the security world and they're trying to package up their hard or software and, and sell it into it. We're not going to get into their business model issues that I see, but we can get into the technology a little bit. Exactly. So a lot of the technology is that the um, AI, there's kind of two routes that all these software vendors take. Um, and so what it is, is they want to be able to, uh, you know, so what it, here, let's back up two seconds. What is really AI? What's AI going to do for our video surveillance industry? And it's going to do one thing. I'm going to break it down to the most simplistic way of it. It's going to take all these dumb security cameras that we have out there, and it's going to make them intelligent or smart. That's what AI is going to do. And you know, the camera is nothing but a sensor. It happens to be the ultimate sensor, but it's a sensor out there. And so what we're able to do with the new AI is that we're able to look at and say, okay, Mr. End Customer, what are things that are helpful or what do you want to get out of your video or what would help you in your business to either make better decisions, react. And that's what AI is going to bring to the table. One of the AI companies I'm working with right now, they have a really good fire detection system. So they can sense smoke long before the fire gets so big that it tips off the fire alarms, you know, then sprinklers, they can see when it's just smoldering in a waste can. Okay. If that's a situation you want to be looking for, you can run that AI application, right? And so what we're seeing is some very good analytics coming out and very um, uh, no, very little false alarms coming off those AIs. And so um, I know that particular company has is doing some stuff with, I believe it's California on the uh, fire towers and putting cameras up there. And they're basically just scanning the area of the, of the, of the trees looking for any smoke and it picks up that there is smoke. Okay. Now it may be that you're having a campfire with your kids and then the ranger's going to show up on you, <laughs> but you know, it's what we need to get to those forest fires quicker, faster, because yeah. the amount of loss that happens on these forest fires is tremendous. Well, what I see is this takes you from, uh, from being a very reactionary uh, solution and video surveillance in particular has has a long history of being called a reactionary uh, right. tool, but it takes you over into a proactive approach and takes you outside of just the realms of physical security, but also into the realms of operational standards um, and gives the uh, the businesses and facility managers much more information to work with on the front end so that they can be proactive about their responses to problems before they become problems. Right. The, the challenge is, is really, you know, these AIs are going to create a whole different value proposition to the actual end user. And as a security integrator, you need to, you need to be learning this technology. You need to be understanding it, how to deploy it, how to, how to get it programmed. Um, one of the other AI companies I'm working with is he's specializing in the production area. So what he's trying to do is he has a lot of AI that is showing the boxes coming down the conveyors and that and he's able to show which boxes have some damage, which ones don't. Um, I know he's working with um, in the um, beverage area where it's showing the levels of the amount of fluids that's in the, it's in the soda can, you know, it's in the, in the clear bottle and he's able to show exactly which ones didn't get a full amount. And he's, you know, he's showing that back to the factory. And then they'll go and pick that and, and adjust what, what went on out there. So they're really, all these guys are starting to really focus in on um, different value props and going after a very specific, you know, um, targeted, you know, customer base. And so once again, it's taking that, you know, what are we using? It's the video surveillance system. We got good megapixel cameras out there, really good sensors, but the security integrator is going to have to start reaching across the aisle here into other departments within the organization and starting to have these conversations. Um, you know, one of our big customers is in the healthcare market and they have a very good patient monitoring system. And today it's, um, if you're a high threat of fall, what they do is in a hospital, they, they park a nurse you know, in your room to make sure that you don't fall out of bed or anything. And it's, it's a human body is going to sit there and make sure you don't fall. Uh, this solution is that we've built a, uh, so MBX is more than just P 
PCs and, com- and computer building. We actually have fabrication tech, fabrication of metal injection molding. So we actually built a medical grade cart with a camera on it. Okay. Um, and that cart gets pushed into the room now and the video and there's analytics that run on the edge, get pumped back to the nurse's station and also to uh, whoever's on duty on, on, onto their, basically their cell phone. They can receive text messages and it's watching the movement of the patient on the bed. And it can predict when that person is one, getting uncomfortable or two is going to make an attempt to get out of that bed. And it will instantly text the nurses on staff that in, in room number three, Neil's trying to get out of his bed and they will get over there. And obviously, and then what they have the nurses station, they have these big screen, 55, 65 inch monitors that have everybody who's got one of those carts in a room up there. So they can just look up and see, you know, also, and it's quite, it, is it video surveillance? You know, it's a video surveillance camera. <laughs> it's software. Hey, it's, we work with software. So it's, it's all the same ingredients but it's just pushed to put together a little differently. Now, the struggle of this is that security has nothing to do with the system. Who has responsibility at the hospital for that system is actually the CNO, the chief nursing officer makes the call on this system. So for a video surveillance integrator to get involved in this type of system, they'd actually have to get away and get, reach out from security and get over to the chief nursing officer and talk about what they're doing for patient monitoring. So we're going to have to expand these, you know, security interiors that, you know, are going to, you know, there, there's money out there. There's quite a bit of money out there. If we get away or push, I'm not saying get, you know, don't, don't, don't go away from the security department, continue to service them, but start getting out into these other departments that will have value for these, these solutions. Certainly a different way to think. Definitely. That AI is just always intriguing. And we have a different technology that we, again, integrate our software with. That's very mind-blowing for sure, Keith. And hearing these different ones, we definitely will hopefully will get the opportunity to integrate those types of AI technology on our software. So very, very interesting. Right. Um, let's go to the next question. Pulling it up. I was just going to get ready to go to the next question. Okay, so um, what are the next emerging trends for the video surveillance market? What do you see? Well, I mean, we kind of just covered the one with AI, right? Um, I think we're going to see, you know, the amount of cameras is going to increase. Um, the, you know, one, one thing that I see, it's kind of interesting and it's a very small topic is, you know, before COVID, it seemed like the security departments and everybody, no, you can't remote into this system any which way. You can't, you know, we're going to put that system in and nobody can touch it. The only way you can get to it is you got to drive your van out there and plug in and see what's going wrong. And they wouldn't, you know, the, the end users wouldn't let anybody touch it beyond the walls of the building. COVID hits and they just opened up all the doors and said, come on in. You know what I mean? And you can remote in. And that was actually a positive for our space because there is good technology to remote into these systems and to service these systems without ever rolling a truck out there. So that, that there, that's a positive, I feel, for the security industry that has happened. It has pushed these end users to allow us to come in remotely. Some of the things we have to watch out for is actually how do we secure that, right? Um, you know, that's going to be the biggest pain point over the next 10 years is securing the camera, securing the edge device, the edge recorder. How do we do it? How do we make sure this stuff is secure? And um, you know that, that's going to be a, a big issue that we need to overcome as an industry. Yeah. Trends, um, you know, and, and I'll speak to it. I'll actually probably post to my LinkedIn, uh, the movie. It's a great little video clip of, of really what happened at Target. How it was Target that Target, you know, locked down their, their enterprise really well. How it was compromised, it was a HVAC contractor out of Pittsburgh um, who had a remote connection into the Target store for servicing the HVAC system, and they compromised the vendor, the HVAC contractor, and got their way in. Right. So they, we're going to have, you know, everybody is going to have to take a very active approach and really, you know, what's the best approach to locking down all this stuff to securing it. Right. Um, you know, we, we, security has been a big uh, issue in the IT space, and it and it really should be a much bigger issue in the video surveillance space as well. Right, and I see an evolution of of kind of two different things because we got a corporate. So whatever they do for corporation, whatever your corporation does, I see, I see a corporate network really there, and I really see this other building network as as we have really 
uh, I think we're evolving to this smart building. You know, we talk about smart city, but smart building technology where we're going to be having, even if there's applications that are cloud-based, it still probably may have to roll through some sort of a server or PC out there before it can tunnel out or a gateway to the cloud. But I see us dropping in maybe the hyper-converged solution and calling it a building solution. And then servicing the video surveillance from there, the access control, the visitor management, the building, the HVAC system could be some fire alarm maintenance software that's there, um, all on a bigger, more robust cluster that's out there. Because if you study what's going, what went on in IT, that they're already doing that. It's just they're not called video surveillance applications or LensSec. They're called that's the email server or that's the you know they have you know it's just other applications. Um, with different types of workloads. But what it is, is they, they've consolidated it on the IT side and they've seen all of the uh, benefits of it. We just haven't done that over on this building side yet. Right. So I see that as an evolving situation. And you know, the other thing that we have to understand about the building networks is we run Cat5 cable right through the outside wall and stick a camera on the outside of the building. I mean, it's kind of nuts, but we do it. And he knocked the camera off and now you technically <laughs> might have a, a, you know, a, a freeway into the network, right? So um, if you had two networks there and they were to compromise that network, I mean, yeah, they can, you know, well, I guess you could unlock some doors if you got any access control, but I mean, you wouldn't be into the credit cards and you wouldn't be into stuff like that that's on the corporate side. You know, so there is some benefits there of 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 these in this dual network situation. Right. All right. So now, uh, very interesting, and I know is involved in LinkedIn. You have been publishing some really interesting polls on LinkedIn lately. Hmm? What is the biggest pain point you have been procuring servers for your physical security projects? So, so this is something I've been doing hardware for fifteen years or so. You know, in the space, and you know. What I was trying to get to the bottom of is trying to understand where the security integrator is having the most pain points for their deployments. Is it that product is arriving late and they can't schedule their crews and it's costing them money because they really can't, they don't really have a good idea of when my product is going to arrive. So that's one. And regardless of where they're procuring the hardware from, two is um, the security integrators today would prefer to procure the hardware from the software vendor. That was another poll I did. I think it was somewhere around 60% of the integrators across the globe. I have a huge following across the globe. Said, you know, we would rather procure it from there. Um, I understand why it's, it's because that box is purpose built for, you know, the, the VMS software or the access control software. Um, it's also, they're going to get better support, you know, from a deployment standpoint and also from a, um, servicing standpoint. Um, and then the third thing is, 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 is a little bit of the sales side is that they can enable, if they're going to be working, let's say with LensSec, they're going to be working with a LensSec regional manager out at the end customer. And you want to try to give that end customer a uh, high level of uh, really good customer, um, you know, customer uh, experience of it. Um, the thing that I can, I can point to, when you build purpose-built hardware for the software, one, it's been tested thoroughly. So we know what we know what the performance should be of the box. We know if there's any issues in the box where you know it could be some sort of a driver or something like that. It's not not wanting to work nice with your software or a port is closed and it doesn't want to you know let the video go out. That should not be there when you're doing purpose built appliances into the space. Okay, um, I point to Apple. Apple's got a very high customer satisfaction on the Apple phones, right? Well, let's break it down. What are the options when you're getting the iPhone 12 Pro? Color and the amount of storage space. Right. Essentially, the hardware is locked. It's exactly that hardware. When you get hardware that's locked in to the software guy, they can give you a very, very good customer experience from that. If you were to just say, oh, I can run the Apple iOS on one of 15 different phone manufacturers, you will not get high level of customer experience. They, they will not like it. They will say it's buggy. There's always an issue. And that's essentially what we're talking about in the video surveillance space is that you know the LensSec video appliances um, are built for LensSec, been tested. The software's been through. The tech support people know exactly when they get a phone call, if there's an issue, they probably know 
exactly what the issue is, you know, before they even get into those machines is to, to see it. So it's all about that customer experience. And if you look at, you know, the cost of, well, I can go out and procure my own server, put it in, you know, in the, you know, the total cost of ownership, you'll find that um, procuring it from the VMS guy is actually cheaper in the long run. Things get really well optimized when, when you have Correct. the software already on the server, already tested. Correct. Uh, right. And then the other thing is a lot of people don't really understand how video flows through the server. Like I said earlier, how the, the IT guys will put big processors in a big RAM and then they'll be like, how can this thing can't, you know, can't do 300 mega streaming video? And it's like, well, you chose the wrong RAID controller. You chose the wrong type of hard drive. You set the RAID controller up wrong because there's a setup within the RAID controller. And we're going to optimize that setup exactly how your software wants to write the data to disk. So you get any misalignment there, you're not going to get the performance out of it. Crazy. All right, another poll, and we'll see how much time we have left. It was great uh, talking again to you about servers and really learning a lot. Which brand of video surveillance grade hard drive do you prefer? Related? Well, this, this was an interesting poll. I, I kind of threw it out there. You know, if, if you like, there's, there's this, um, you know, in the video recording market, there's Seagate and there's Western Digital who have come out with uh, video grade, you know, drives, okay, to service the space. Um, the drives are built more for uh, write intensive situations. So, you know, one of the big um, mistakes that people make in here is they choose the wrong grade of hard drive and they put it in the machine and they said, ah, hard drive's a hard drive. Um, I can get them on Amazon for $100 a piece. They stick it in the box and it, and it blows up, you know, you know, a couple months later. And it's because the hard drive is not, was not designed for that workload. Um, this is a poll that actually expected that Seagate would actually have won. It was actually Western Digital. Um, more people said, you know, hey, Western Digital is the one I prefer in my boxes. Not really sure where that's coming from because I, I was I'm very much expecting that Seagate for the USA market was, was a bigger, um, you know, company that would uh, would have had a higher polling. But, um, you know, if you look at both of them, they, they are about equal on performance and equal on you know, how, they actually, how the drive is actually built. All right, and one other poll is where do you go to gain knowledge of products, technology, or industry news? Yeah, this, this is where, you know, this is more for my marketing department and really, you know, as, as we as we have shifted in the pandemic and everything, you know, you know, the question is is, you know, where do you go either on from a sales perspective? Let's let's talk about that. And let's say that you hear that there could be a job out there somewhere. You know, potential video surveillance job at an end user. So as a sales guy, you know, what I was trying to gain knowledge from was, and I was actually trying to prove it to my marketing department who claims that they're smarter about marketing, but um, is where do you go as a person? So wh where, I, where I think everybody goes, first of all, is if we know that Apex plastic company may have a video surveillance job, you're going to do two things. You're going to go to the website, see what you know about this Apex, see where they're located. You know, and then you're going to go to LinkedIn to figure out who the heck works there. And then you're going to try to get your way in there to, to, to get out, to, to be able to pr provide that. Right. So that was one thing I wanted to see was, you know, are you going to customers' websites and LinkedIn? And I believe those were the two that won out. Those were the two top yeah, ones. Sure. And then, you know, but then I also changed it up, I think, in this one where I was like, hey, you know, from a video surveillance knowledge perspective, where are you going to know about that new AI technology or, you know, that? And so um, once again, it was, it was, it was websites and, and, and LinkedIn. And, you know, the, the, the flyers, the data sheets, all that is kind of old. Um, the trade show, um, I think that's pretty low. I thought, I mean, I know it's pandemic wow. year. Maybe people, you know, you know, people didn't say trade show is where I go to get that knowledge, right? Um, I think the other one was vendor rep. So if you have a rep firm or, you know, so, you know, or if your sales rep actually showed up in the office or, or, or on a Zoom call, you know, they would gain some knowledge from there, right? But um, also, um, when you also talk about websites, what are the websites? I mean, like so, so the manufacturers types of news that yeah. is on websites, but where you're going to learn a lot about things that are going on the latest trends. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what websites would you say would, that are in the security industry that, that kind of would jump on? I mean, because honestly, that's a big thing I'm trying to learn in the learning curve of, you know, I've been yeah. in for two plus years, but as a podcaster and host of this, I really want to learn more and more. Where would you go? especially with your knowledge base of this industry? I don't think there's a great website. I mean, there's, there's the manufacturer website, 
you know, of the video management software, the camera and that, and you can gain some knowledge through there, you know, and through their trainings, but there's not any great general website to go to. You know, you look at the, you know, the traditional security press, right? The, you know, the, the magazines and that, and it's very much advertising. It's very much, you know, there's not really great knowledge that really? is, that, that they won't, well, my take on it. And I'm sure those guys are going to call me right after this podcast um, to complain to me is that you read these articles and it seems like they, ta- they, they, they tackle a topic in the first paragraph and then they have 17 quotes below it from all these different people. And that seems like what those articles are. And it's not hard hitting enough. It's not gaining me knowledge. It's not saying, hey, there's a trend coming. You know, and that's what, if you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll see that I'm talking about Kubernetes. I'm talking about containerizing. I'm talking about edge computing. I'm saying, hey guys, this is all coming at us. If you guys want to learn about that, the Linux Foundation, great organization. You can go out there and take online classes, which cost you two, $300. And you will learn about this technology that is going to be coming at us. And that's... You know, if you don't if you don't get on board with it, you are going to be out of business because the, you know it's going to you know tech, technology shift is going to happen. I just published the whole uh, great little video about Netflix and Blockbuster on on LinkedIn, and really what I'm trying to say is, look, there's a technology shift that happened. Blockbuster was didn't I don't know if they didn't see it happening or they didn't believe it was going to happen, and next thing you know, they're out of business, and Netflix owns the streaming market. Right. Netflix was just like Blockbuster. So Keith, yeah. this guy, Tom Larson should be, in my opinion, have his own podcast. That's all I have to say. <laughs> well, why don't I just take over yours then? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> all right. We'll see Tom Larson next week on What's Your Perspective? <laughs> yep. No, it's What's Tom's Perspective? What's Tom's Perspective? Yeah. Well, you, you've, uh, you've given us a lot of food for thought today. Um, we've uh, talked about some things that, uh, that really just kind of blow my mind. Uh, so thanks for being on with us today. It's really helpful. A no helpful problem. Conversation. I, think, I think that uh, Neil and I both have, have a lot to think about. Awesome. I definitely think so, especially when talking to end users and integrators all the time. These are things to definitely look at. And especially when we talk about the AI technology and specifically how we use servers, because I don't think they understand that. And that's why they have to go. So the best place to connect with you, Tom, is LinkedIn. As a, as Correct. A, Correct. Till we get things going rolling in Clubhouse, Tom. There you go. Correct. Watch out. We're coming for you. We're yeah. getting you in the Clubhouse. So everyone needs to learn about Clubhouse. That's for sure. Yep. Right? I'm, the, I'm the Clubhouse educator. Uh, on my in the mornings in the morning early mornings and, and podcasting so again yep. check out tom there and uh again everyone thank you for watching what's your perspective go to lensec.com slash live to catch up on all the episodes also we're available on anchor and spotify and also itunes and i appreciate everyone tuning in and look forward to next week's what's your perspective and thanks again tom for stopping by all right thanks guys all right guys that was what's your perspective guys 